In my latest model building video, I'll be trying out a few detailing techniques new to me on this F-15C Eagle kit by Tamiya. The F-15 is probably my favorite U.S. fighter jet in terms of its external appearance. It's sleek with wide wings and the double vertical tail, and it also appears like a sturdy flying tank. The box contains three main packages of sprue constituting the bulk of the jet and a smaller bag with the cockpit glass items. There are also miniature metal rods included to reinforce the landing gear. If you include the missiles, fins, external tanks, and their associated pylons, the total part count for this model is about 110 pieces. The decal sheet offers the tail letters EG Echo Golf, signifying an F-15 base at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, ZZ Zulu Zulu for Kadena Air Base in Japan, and FF Foxtrot Foxtrot for a fighter from Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. However, I'll be making my own stencil with the letters LN Lima November, denoting a US F-15 based at Lake and Heath Royal Air Force Base in the UK. Let's take a look at the upper fuselage. I'll be spending a lot of time on this piece. It's a large portion of the jet's exterior, and I will need to take care to detail, weather, and make the best presentation I can of this component. Essentially, this is most likely the area that will initially draw any viewer in for a closer look, if it's interesting. From there, the observer will hopefully take more time to inspect other features of the model and take in the overall efforts placed in its assembly. I won't be showing every single step of the construction of this model. I think the most interesting part of building any kit are the methods of painting, weathering, and dirtying up a model to resemble the real thing as closely as possible. This will be an out-of-the-box build with no added aftermarket photo etch or resin parts. Principally, this build will be about what I can do, with what I have, and what basic skills I can bring into play. Step one of the build is the cockpit. However, I've brought in other parts requiring the same paint coloring to accomplish this in one stage. This blue coloring is unusual for the interior of an aircraft. Most of the time I've seen white, black, zinc chromate yellow, or even green, but not blue. And I hit the forward portion of the cockpit with the sky gray. Next I used the oil base watered down flat black to make a wash to bring out the rivets and the crevices of the uh, piping and uh, bulkhead support. Next I clean up the excess with a cotton swab. Though I do leave a little in the open areas to give that dirty look that uh, most uh, operational jets have. As you can see, a simple wash can create a realism of shadow effects that bring out the details on these surfaces. In this shot, the cockpit portion is almost complete. However, the aft avionics bay detail will be lost once the walls are completed. I selected the subsonic option for the air intakes in step 2. We are now ready for step 3. Moving right along, we have the upper and lower halves of the port and starboard wing bonded and drying. Next, we look at the lower fuselage, specifically the air intake portions. Looking at actual pictures of the F-15, I've seen variations in the air intake color schemes. Uh, I'm going to do a light gray in this area, a darker gray in the next portion, followed by gloss white in the rear portion to follow the color scheme of a F-15 picture that I liked. Here's a progress shot with the gloss white painted in the upper and lower fuselage for the aft portion of the air intakes. On the bottom portion, I've also hit the landing gear bays. Further back, you can see the AIM-7 Sparrow missiles and three external fuel tanks drying after being bonded together. The trickiest part of the construction so far is putting the nose gear together. I have to place a metal support rod within the two halves of the main support while also gluing both halves of the wheel at the same time since the rod goes into the wheel. The wheel will not be able to rotate. 
Additionally, I have to place the support arm of the gear within two pivot holes in the main support. I pry the two portions slightly apart to get this arm in. Finally, I have another support arm and the door to add. These are small pieces and it was quite difficult to manipulate with my hands and many tools. I ended up wrecking the paint job and I'll have to redo the white on the gear before weathering it. For my camouflage reference templates, I've scanned the painting instructions from the Tamiya build manual. I measured lengths on the parts of the model and compared with the drawings such as the leading edge of the left wing. Doing a little algebra, I calculated that an average of 2.86 times or a 286% enlargement is needed of these drawings to make airbrush cutouts for my model. Continuing with preliminary work, I begin with the ejection seat. I've already painted the seat cushion, the oxygen bottle, the ejection handles, and the seat rail. I now add a paint chipping effect by dabbing a piece of rubber foam in silver paint and touch areas of the seat. And here's a closer look to see what we've come up with. Now that we've completed our color scheme for the air intakes, it's ready to mate the upper and lower fuselages together and begin the major construction of this project. I was surprised and disappointed that these two portions did not line up very well, which means additional work. These are some clips of the sanding involved in order to make the seam line disappear between the two halves. I've placed thick painter's tape on the surrounding areas to protect details such as panel lines, vents, and raised features from being erased by the sanding efforts. I slowly work my way down the line doing a section at a time. Generally I'll go over the line with a circular motion and also perpendicular to the seam. Looking at the inverted left side, we see the air intake which has a natural seam line which works since in reality this section moves up and down depending on the F-15's mode of flight. There is a pivot point, but the lip of the intake should have no seam line. I've sanded this area away to make it flush and it should disappear altogether when the first coat of paint is applied. Next is a shot of the port wing attached and drying. In the foreground is one of my enlarged reference sheets for mapping out the camouflage pattern. And now an overhead shot with both wings attached. These fit very well onto the fuselage. Getting to the start of the work to get the model to look more like a real fighter jet, I begin with black shading. This coat is multi-purpose. It serves as a primer coat. It also creates an effect of depth and shadows in areas. And it will be our overall base coat. This base coat is the foundation for the variation of paint tones in our two-color camouflage scheme. A final result will simulate wear and fading due to the sun and various weather conditions, as well as normal operational use. I'm using my standard mix of airbrush paint. I methodically go over the entire surface, taking care not to miss crevices, narrow areas, and recessed areas that may need airbrushing from different angles, such as numerous vents and gratings that are present on the F-15. Although I have not specifically shown the preparation, I have covered the cockpit, landing gear base, as well as the air intakes using tape and cotton to protect these areas from overspray. I'm definitely not a fan of having to touch up areas because of random paint spray as it tends to make things worse. I usually have to start over again if this happens to a section of a model. Images of the F-15 underside usually show an evenly painted surface less prone to the sun and weather and only being blemished by the effects of fluid leaks and grime so I applied some of the dark coat here just to add depth. Looking at F-15 photographs, the tails are more uniform in appearance and don't have as much of the tonal variations as the top of the main wings and fuselage. Since the vertical tails are less prone to standing water, direct sunlight, and maintenance foot traffic, I'm going to use the pre-shading technique on these surfaces to create a contrasting look between them and the horizontal surfaces. I'm also going to use the pre-shading technique for the external fuel tanks. External stores are often swapped out, or not even used depending on mission requirements. They will have a different wear pattern, so they may have a dissimilar appearance than the overall jet they are attached to. The pre-shading technique will provide that contrast I'm looking for. I begin cutting out pieces of the camo pattern to map out on the model prior to the start of the airbrushing of the color coats. 
These pieces will provide guidelines for the marbling or modeling technique to get those realistic external paint variations. I do quick sizing checks of the diagram sections on the model surfaces and they are matching nicely with the exterior parts. I place more of my enlargements on glass for trimming. By cutting the template in this way, I have a stencil as well as its negative. This gives me the flexibility in which order of the colors I paint and the ability to make touch-ups to the camouflage as needed. I'm having some trepidation about starting the rendering of the camouflage as it is the prime part of the exterior paintwork and any mistakes will set me back significantly. I begin to stall by doing other steps of the fabrication of this F15. Using a custom color mix, I apply the paint with a heavier coat at the forward portion of the engine nozzles, then feather it out with a lighter coat as I get nearer to the aft exhaust openings. The main landing gear also gets the supporting rod during assembly. As you can see, the wheel hub and tire are affixed to a rectangular tab rather than a round peg in this kit, which will prevent rotation. To make the missiles more accurate, I'm boring a nozzle into the aft portion of each of the shafts. I start with a guide hole using my knife. I used a power drill in the beginning, which I do not recommend. It's harder to control and a mistake can happen very rapidly if you're not steady and straight on. Consequently, I used a manual drill to bore those nozzles into the Sidewinder missiles. I was better able to make adjustments and review my progress than I had had with my Sparrow rocket efforts. Now it's time to paint the main body of the AIM-7 missiles. Next I masked off the sparrows to add the color bands which I think works better than freehand painting them. To test the quality of my custom camo colors, I begin the second step of the pre-shading technique on the vertical tails, horizontal stabilizers, pylons, and external fuel tanks with camo color number one. The trick of course is to filter down our dark pre-shade lines, but not so far as to completely obliterate them. Don't be impatient. Continue to take a moment to see how the overall effect is changing until you get the exterior you're looking for. You can always add, but if you go too far, you'll have to rework it. I also use the pre-shading method with Camo 1 on the external fuel tanks to get that dissimilar appearance when compared to the fuselage exterior. Some modelers don't like the pre-shading technique, often saying it's too grid-like. Working on F-16s on the flight line during hot summers, I observed that jets and external tanks would often sweat out liquids such as fuel or hydraulic fluid and it was around the panel lines, screws, and spaces between flaps and wings. So I don't necessarily agree that the grid-like effect is an inaccurate depiction. I now use my stencils to add my second camo color. The advantage I have also by using enlargements of the instructions is that I can line up the template with the flap and panel lines from the diagram plates on the flight surfaces for proper orientation. The inboard sides of the vertical tails have a negative pattern compared to the outboard sides. I fix these cutouts as necessary. The secret here is to place the stencil on the part, but not too tightly. You want it to float so that there is a diffuse line between the two colors and not a very distinct edge. Because of this, it's better to airbrush at right angles to the surface to avoid paint going underneath the stencil. To control this method, I lined up my parts vertically so that I could hold my airbrush horizontally.
Similarly, I hit the inboard sides of the vertical tails also at a 90 degree angle to the surfaces. And now the scary part. I remove my templates to discover if my prep work has paid off on these two color camo patterns. Being an amateur builder, I must say I'm very pleased at this outcome. Continuing on, I will airbrush the tail flash banner rather than make a custom decal. For Lake and Heath 493rd Fighter Squadron known as the Grim Reapers, it is a wide blue horizontal strip straddled by thinner yellow stripes at the top of the vertical tails both inboard and outboard sides. The tail letters LN are simple and big enough on this 148th scale model for me to make an airbrush stencil for this as well. Unlike the camouflage pattern, we need clear defined edges for the lettering. To help secure a close fit, I hold down my template. Now that the yellow has dried, I repaint with the blue to make the center stripe and also create two thin yellow strips at the same time. I now cut out my upper fuselage stencils starting with the wings. Definitely use a good knife. I keep an oil stone handy to keep my blade razor sharp. I'm using Tamiya masking tape which has a lower tackiness to it so that it doesn't pull up the primer paint. Again, the diagram markings on my printouts make it easier to align with the actual panel lines of the model. I neglected to account for the antenna which I had already glued to the jet, so rather than pulling it off, I cut a slot on my speed brake stencil portion. With the two engine nacelle stencils affixed, the top of the fuselage is ready for paint. And we mustn't forget the nose portion below the cockpit. I finally begin a new technique for me known as the marbling or modeling method. This will produce random variations in the color coat starting with camo number one. This effect will simulate sun bleaching, weathering, and wear experienced by jets during their normal operating service between repaint jobs. As before, I place my model upright to create a right angle roughly to my airbrush paint spray. However, I probably could have skipped doing this. I incorrectly started out holding my airbrush too far from the model causing broad strokes of paint to be applied rather than narrow streams needed to make scale accurate differences in the color layer. I more correctly hold my airbrush close to the model on the left side. Notice the narrow jets of paint I get now. I try to make a crude tiger stripe pattern as my guide. I kept pulling back and I had to continually remind myself to keep the airbrush close to the model. I repositioned my model to get a closer view as I continued. I could already see that this technique was going to pay off. The exterior was already looking like the outer layer of a carrier based F-14 or F-18. All I have to do is adjust to make it look more like an Air Force F-15. I slowly add layers to attain the general appearance I desire. I continually work over the areas and frequently reevaluate the progress making sure I'm remaining consistent in the facade. You certainly have great opportunities here to make your jet as beat up and worn as you want. At this stage, it could really look like an abandoned jet. This plane even looks like it has its own special camouflage now as well. Here I'm getting to the final layer where I will cease adding more paint and leave the weathered pattern I've come up with behind. For the underside, the marble method wouldn't be so accurate. I attempt to do a reverse pre-shading by concentrating the paint in the center of panels after a broad coverage is already achieved of camouflage number one. I try to keep the panel lines darker and leave areas of shadow.
I remove my stencils for the first color and get a preview of my progress. I now have camouflage number one to a black camo number two. Camouflage one is now masked off and we're ready to add in camouflage two over our NATO black primer coat. I found that I'm not having trouble keeping the paint spray from going under my templates if I'm mindful. I elect to start the marble coat of Camouflage 2 with the F15 in the horizontal position. I duplicate my efforts by making random patterns of narrow streamed paint within the borders of my cutouts. Having gained some experience and learning from my first camouflage coat, you see now that I've much improved the application of paint and making good random lines on the next color. On the right side, I begin filling in the areas with layers, keeping an eye on the overall look of the fading effect and shadows. After I pull up my outlines, I expectedly find a few dark lines where the two camouflage colors didn't quite meet up. I can use my templates again and adjust them to touch up, or I can use a thin paintbrush and dry brush in the gaps. I'm afraid I might overspray and fill in my weathered look, so I decide to brush in the corrections. I use my already thinned custom airbrush colors. I wipe some paint off on my papers prior to applying it to the model to match the depth of my previously sprayed layer. And voila! I have a terrific natural looking exterior surface. It looks worn, bleached, and uneven in its colors, just like a real large scale jet. I'm absolutely thrilled with the outcome. There's more work ahead, however. At the aft portion, there is a titanium heat shield. Tamiya inappropriately lists the color as X10 gun metal, which is much too dark. The actual shield is more of a silver and can even seem like chrome in appearance. I'm substituting a more accurate color. I take advantage of my black shading and let it peek out here and there to simulate a tarnished surface from the extreme temperatures produced by the engines. I will work more detail in it during the weathering phase of the project. This metallic paint is hard on my airbrush and tends to clog up the gun. I'm going to have to do a complete breakdown and clean up after working this heat cover. Even though I painted and did a little detail on the radar dish, I never intended to display it. So in it goes to be covered up. I think it's a fun secret. Only you and I know it's there. I've applied a gloss coat to my vertical tails and now we can apply washes to enhance panel lines, introduce fluid leaks, grime, and add decals. I'm using these smaller pieces as a test bed to iron out any unforeseen problems with my weathering. I do not want to find out too late and ruin the main fuselage body and wings. As usual, I use my oil-based wash diluted with mineral spirits to highlight panel lines and also make grime streaks from leaking fluids contaminated with dirt. I clean up perpendicular to lines, but also try to streak in the direction of in-flight airflow. I can use a cotton swab with some mineral spirits to clean up areas if the wash sits too long in the wrong place. I particularly like the used grimy look I'm getting on the external fuel tanks. For some of the final clips of the work, I thought I'd show the top fuselage as I add panel enhancement using a wash. I leave some of the paint in areas to simulate fluid leaks and grime. On the underside, I continue the same process of filling in panel lines. I rub at right angles to these panel lines. If I come to an intersection of lines already at 90 degrees, I wipe the swab at roughly a 45 degree angle to clean up and leave the wash in the recesses. I purposely leave residue behind in places to simulate more fluid leaks and mixed grime. I've created my own custom decals of a random F-15 tail number from Lake and Heath, the 493rd emblem, a pilot nameplate, as well as the U.S. Air Forces in Europe emblem using a Photoshop and Microsoft Word program and printed them on a blank decal sheet. 
This video is getting long, so I'll present just a few more clips of the weathering and decal application before the final reveal. Just trimming up the tail number 86164 here, and I'll use Microset and Microsol to place and then solidify all my decals on this model. The tail number seems a little darker than my LN, but after I dull coat the whole model with Tamiya TS80, everything should balance out across the entirety of the model. I know there are better model builders on the internet, but I hope you found this to be entertaining and maybe give you a few ideas for your next model project.